It has a bus interface, same as the debug registers for the core. Peter Eagle has introduced the core side uh, architecture a little bit. This is a significant change. Um, with it, we are able to 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 program the 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 ETM via a bus interface, but we need to know where the ETM is located. So we might have additional steps for configuring the target site. Um, also very important is that we do not have a direct trace interface to outside. The uh, embedded trace microcell here is embedded into a more complex uh, trace infra infrastructure in your chip. This also enables us having multiple trace sources um, be be exported via a single via a single trace port. This is not possible with previous um, ETM versions. There you would have uh, a, a single trace port for each ETM. If you have two cores, you would need two trace ports or have some kind of proprietary logic to merge them somehow together. How does it look like um, our ETM? Export the data via a trace bus. It is part of a core side infrastructure. I will give you an example after it. And between uh, uh, the pins and the ETM, now we have the additional TPIU, um, which is uh, now our main uh, trace interface to control. A very important feature is also the uh, TPIU on some rare chips is also be able to get feeded by an external clock source. This would save, let's say, a PLL inside the chip. Some of our customers use it so that the trace clock is not provided chip internally, but from outside. How could such a trace infrastructure look like? This is an image that you already have seen in Peter Eagle's slides. So we have our ETM or PTM here. All the trace streams are now uh, maybe funneled together. We have here uh, four different trace sources. Additionally, a system trace macro cell, which is some kind of software trace. They are funneled together and then can be separated for storing it into an embedded trace buffer or exported it via a physical trace port outside the chip. And this is just a very simple example. It can be very, very complex. The core side system is modular, and the chip designers have a lot of freedom to, uh, to design it, and it is used. So this is a comparable, simple view to a core side system. So multi-core trace, how can, it, how can it look like? In this case, I picked out the SMP view. If you have an AMP system, then you would have two different instances of Trace32 of our PowerView environment, and you would see the trace information for both cores independently. They can be tracked together over the different instances, but in this case, we have an SMP trace, and as you can see, we have the different core informations, different colors for, 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 for the traces, and also the, uh, the chart window would offer uh, a, a few separated for the different cores. So this is supported by our software. And as you can see in here too, there's a, there's a, there are blocks. So several instructions executed on, on, on core one, several instructions executed on core zero, then back to core one. This is due to the packet format uh, that one trace packet, one atom trace packet covers multiple instructions in the program flow. Something very special, but I want to I want to I want to mention it, is HSSTP. HSSTP stands for High Speed Serial Trace Port. It's an extension. So our trace port interface unit that we have seen from the slides before will not directly go to our pins, but export its data to a high-speed serial trace port uh, a module based on, uh, 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 based on the Xilinx Aurora uh, modules. And 
this module will make a parallel to serial conversion and output the trace data via uh, different count of HSSTP lanes. Supports up to 6.5 gigabits per lane. Um, while HSSTP itself supports up to six lanes, one, two, three, four, up to six, our tool just supports up to four lanes. But currently, there's no practical target that supports four lanes. We have seen three lanes, but not more. Um, why do we not see this very often in, 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 uh, on, on many chips? High-speed serial trace board pins are very expensive. They need a, they have a high power consumptions, so they are only um, used for devices that already have high-speed pins. For example, if a chip has a has a PCI Express interface or a, a USB 3 could be also um, a, a point, um, but or a serial ATA interface, then we will see also chips having uh, such a high-speed trace board. But for mobile chips, no, we, were, we, we do not know mobile chips, for example, that have uh, such a trace board. I was talking about um, the different ETMs and, and, and ETM versions, and also we often see ETM versus PTM. What's actually the difference? Um, I have shown you in the slide before that PTM is available for Cortex-A9 and Cortex-A15, while ETM is available for all previous cores. So why having a different, a different kind of, of trace microcell? The answer is simple. ARM is pushing their cores into more and more higher speeds, but the trace ports itself will not get wider and they will not get faster. So we have to reduce as much data as possible, increasing the compression. And compared to ETM v3, we have a lot of information for each instruction that is executed. We have an information executed, 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 and also for non-executing for non-executed instructions, this is very important for our code coverage we have an information. So our code coverage can be very exact. For that particular instruction, we can say not executed. And it will be part of all statistics. This instruction was not executed. And once we see that, we can, um, we need to, the customer need to think over how to remove that code if it is not used. PTM always have some kind of waypoint information. There's a branch with an updated address. The PTM outputs this address until the next branch, no other information will be output. So this means, especially for our move, uh, for our condition to move and copy instruction, um, we do not know if it is executed or not. So at the same time, we assume it is okay. Same code executed on the same conditions, but with different results. And here I have a comparison of features for the different versions. Again, listed the different cores with the different ETM versions. So the top one, always the same. We support program flow trace for all uh, ETM, PTM versions, of course. This is uh, the main usage of this module. Data address. We come into a point, Cortex-A15 does not support, A9 and A15 do not support any kind of data trace, so it's simply empty. Cortex-A8 is also limited compared to Cortex-A5 and A7 because it just outputs the addresses without any data information. For Cortex-A5 and A7, we have at least the writes, the written uh, data values, which could be, uh, um, uh, which could be uh, useful for the cache analysis. And context ID, this is a mandatory feature because it will enable us uh, uh, RTOS debugging where different uh, cores um, 
uh, where different threads are executed on a, on, a, on, a, on the core. What can we do with all these features? For, um, for, for example, read-write breakpoints, that is a feature for the ETMs, it cannot be used for Cortex-A9 and A15. This has to be aware. The Cortex-A9 and A15, they already have very limited capabilities for breaking on certain data accesses, but additionally we are not able to, to fix it by using the ETM instead. Trace-based debugging, as I have showed you on one slide with single, uh, with forward on step and backward stepping, it is available for all cores. CTS-based data view, of course, it depends on the capabilities for, for, the, for the ETM. Cortex-A8, 9 and 15 do not support any data reconstruction for, for our uh, trace-based debugging. CTS-based cache analysis, that's okay. That's, um, we do not see the exact cache content, but we can say at least um, this access has, 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 has generated a hit or a miss in the cache. The address information is enough for it. And for code coverage, um, code and variable coverage, we uh, have for older cores and for Cortex-R cores the full capabilities. And on higher performance cores, we need to, um, we need to uh, reduce the variable feature set. A5 and A7, we will have at least the data writes be visible. Once there's a data write, we can say this address now contains that value. For read accesses, we cannot reconstruct it. Um, for Cortex-A8, we can say at least there was an access. And um, for Cortex-A15, we have the lowest feature set because here only branches are visible. And as I said, um, conditional instructions, as they are very common in, in ARM code, are not uh, visible. Other trace sources, beside the ETM trace, which is the most often used trace, that's why I spend the most time on it, um, we also might have a system trace in our chip. What is a system trace? The system trace uh, is is, is, a, is a unit that contains several channels. In the simplest case, it's, it's a register on the, on, the, on the target memory side, which the target software can write to, and it will generate a trace packet. Or we have hardware modules connected to certain channels on the STM, which also might generate hardware events. And these are output via the trace port. How does it look like? not very interesting because our debugger is not aware of uh, what can be done with the system trace. So we just collect a bunch of numbers. Hmm. Not very useful. But our tool is able to dock custom DLLs. So if you write your instrumented code, you can also provide the DLL to our debugger that decodes the raw information from the STM or ITM and display it in a way it is useful for you. Or you can pipe it to an external application, which is also a very common use case. Another very important trace macro cell is the HTM. The HTM is a bus trace macro cell. AHB bus trace macro cell, the H is the uh, the AH, the H from the AHB is the H from here. So what it is, you have different cores in your target system. There's an AHB pass and the HTM can directly monitor it. While the ETM only sees the trace information coming from the core, including data accesses, the HTM can watch all accesses coming from any source on the, on, on the AHB bus. And it is displayed in a way that we can see the addresses, um, the direction, and values. The HTM itself, what is the difference between uh, HTM and ETM? The HTM is a pure bus trace, while the ETM is mainly a flow trace. 
Um, the HTM, as I said, all accesses from the bus, including DMA controllers, different cores are all visible while the ETM only gives the data accesses from the core. Very important difference is also that the HTM o only sees physical address mapping, while the ETM only sees the virtual address mapping. So if you have a Linux system, this uh, or complex Arto system with a complex MMU mapping, this will be different to get correlated. And the HTM will not see uh, uh, um, data accesses from a core that generates a cache miss. These accesses are handled between the cache and the core and the main bus is not involved for it, so they are invisible. So if your core does not have a data trace at all provided by the ETM, the HTM is not a full replacement for that missing data trace. Bandwidth considerations let's look how fast our tools are and what theoretically is possible on the target side. On the top side, we have our tools with typical configurations in, 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 in bold font and we have typical configurations for cores and their estimated uh, trace, generated trace data. Uh, dark blue is the, the, the average and a light blue would be the peak data value. So a typical configuration uh, for, uh, for our tools would be the PowerTrace 2 with autofocus 2 running at 16-bit. This is a very common configuration. So we have a specific bandwidth that our tools offers to record the trace. And then we see on the target side there are a few configurations which highly exceeds this provided bandwidth. For example, here the peak for Cortex-A9 core running at 1 gigahertz with program plus cycle accurate will generate a lot of, really a lot of trace data. And this is not a very unusual uh, case. Um, this we will see, this we will see uh, 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 very often. And 1 gigahertz, hmm, today we are uh, faster for different cores. So we could assume um, that our tools are not fast enough for, for, for newer chips. Um, but this is only the half-truth. The problem that we always have is that the trace port itself provided by the target is not able to export the trace data um, fast enough for, for, for the course that works inside. So this is the typical configuration for available trace ports. And this is again from the previous slide, um, the uh, estimated trace data generation uh, from the core. And for typically, typically uh, uh, available trace ports, let's take this one in bold 200 megahertz double data rate running at 16 bit. Even the trace port for the specific chip would not be able to export the trace data for, uh, uh, for the cores inside. So in that case, we have to reduce the, the, the trace data somehow. It's a limitation of the chip. Our tools are, uh, uh, suits the available chips and their trace board speeds, but even that is usually not fast enough for the cores that works inside. This is what I want to show you with these lights.